is Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast, helping foodies discover new restaurants and new friends. Here's your host, the founder of Mystery Meat, Seth Ressler. Hello, and welcome to Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler. Uh, this is the podcast where we talk to local food writers about uh, their cities and their favorite restaurants in those cities, where to go if you go visit. And today, we're going to Atlanta. We're going uh, down south with a woman named Hope Philbrick, who's the founder and editor-in-chief of Getaways for Grown Ups. Before I introduce her, I do want to tell you what Mystery Meat is. Uh, this is a great social dining group. We started, it, we get a bunch of foodies together, and we started in Boston a couple of years ago, and it's basically a bunch of foodies who all want to go try a new restaurant. But there's a catch. They don't find out what the restaurant is until 24 hours in advance. So you sign up, you got some clues there, but you, you know, unless you're really good, you don't know where you're going. And then we get about 20 foodies or so together and they have a great time. And it's for people who like to talk about food. And it's not really like a singles thing. It's not like a business networking thing. It's just people of all ages who love to get together and talk about food and talk about restaurants over a great meal. Uh, and so we would love to have you. We'd love to host one in your city. All you need to do is go to mysterymeet, M-E-E-T dot org, and click the big orange button that says get an invitation. And we see a lot of interest in your city. We'll, we'll start a dinner there. Let's talk to Hope Philbrick of Atlanta. Hope. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, wow, let's talk about all the things you've done. Uh, your latest project is Getaways for Grown Ups. You are the founder and editor-in-chief. Uh, you have been published in dozens of nationwide publications, the Atlantan, the Georgia Travel Guide, uh, the Where Guestbook, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, you have been the contributing editor of Epicure Magazine. Uh, you are the managing editor of Restaurant Forum, the assistant editor of Wine Magazine, and you've got a blog. I don't know how you have time for that on top of everything else, uh, but it's called Insatiable Thirst and Hunger and Wanderlust. I think it's fair to say you write about food a lot. Yes, I do. I write about it almost every day. So tell me how you got into that. I was working in corporate communications and human resources, and I decided, well, I'd always wanted to be a freelancer, but I was going to be going on a vacation with a friend of mine because I had 10 shares of Robert Mondawi stock, and then that entitled me to be able to go to the shareholders meeting. So my friend and I decided to use that as an excuse to go to California, go to some wineries. And um, I decided before I went there that I would just pitch that as a possible article to the Wine Report magazine here in Atlanta. And they ended up buying the story. And everything grew from there because then the editor asked me to do some other work. And, you know, eventually I ended up becoming a, an assistant editor at that magazine. And, and it just grew from there. So I feel like I'm really, really lucky because I love writing about travel, food, wine, and spirit. So tell me about your latest project, Getaways for Grown Ups. Well, that started because as a travel and food writer, uh, I realized that there was the niche of travelers that are adults without children. And that there wasn't really much specifically geared towards them. A lot of venues try so hard to be family friendly. And there's a lot of travel writers. As a travel writer, a lot of times you're traveling with other travel writers. And a lot of them are writing for, you know, mommy blogs or family travel blogs. But there didn't seem to be anything in the marketplace for adults. And as it turns out, my husband and I don't have children. So I, I knew that that was a a missing link for people. And so I decided to just start it up myself. Oh, that sounds cool. So give me an example of a, of a trip or a getaway that uh, two grown-ups might want to do. There might be uh, hotels that have maybe a separate floor for adults or certain packages to encourage people to visit at certain times of year when kids are in school. And then there's certain destinations that are obviously adult-friendly, such as distilleries or wineries. And a lot of cities or states have various wine roads. Or in Kentucky, there's the Kentucky Bourbon Trail that links the various distilleries in Kentucky. So that's a fun trip that I've done before. Tell me about that. That sounds like a lot of fun. It was fun. I think there's nine or ten distilleries that are on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. And you just uh, can drive to the different distilleries, get a tour, learn about the, the history of bourbon making in Kentucky, and then they do have tastings. But it's not like at a winery where you have a wine tasting and you might taste 12 things and need to call a cab on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> you get a little <laughs> a little taste. Well, bourbon is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then if you have time to go up to Louisville, Kentucky, they have an urban bourbon trail. 
and they have several different bars that, that are on this trail. And you, if you go there and get different bourbon drinks, you can get a stamp and a little urban bourbon passport that they have for you. And then if you get how many of her stamps they require, then at the end you get a free T-shirt. So that's also kind of fun. All right, so this is the new thing that I'm putting on my bucket list, the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Yeah, it's really fun. I recommend it. I'm coming to you for advice before I go. Okay. You've been writing for over a decade about food and travel and wine. Uh, How have you seen the industry change in that time? You know, what is it like to write about food now versus what it was like 10 or 12 years ago? Well, I think that on the one hand, there's more opportunity because you can just start up a blog, but there's also less because there's so many blogs and online outlets. There's fewer publications that pay writers. So if you want to make a living at it, there's less opportunity than there used to be. Also, because of the current economy, a lot of newspapers have had to cut their coverage of dining because they can't have the budget to send a writer to the restaurant like they maybe used to. So is there any advice you'd give to aspiring writers? Well, I think you should hone your writing skills and probably have a day job to pay the bills because <laughs> you, <don't know, laughs> you don't know if you're going to be able to make it or not. Good to know. All right, let's talk about the the city that you've been in for a while now, uh, the great city of Atlanta. Yeah, I love Atlanta. How long have you been there? All of 98 and since. So if I'm a foodie and I'm coming to Atlanta for the first time, what do I need to know about the city? I mean, what is the city known for? And what are some of the great, you know, restaurant neighborhoods to go check out? Atlanta is the biggest city in all of the Southeast. So it's kind of like the New York of the South. And it has everything that you could possibly want to eat. I mean, if there's a culture on earth that has a cuisine, we probably have a restaurant here that serves that. But we don't have one food that we're known for. It's not like we have a, a, like Philadelphia has the Philly cheesesteak, or maybe in Boston, you'd definitely want to get some clam chowder. I don't know that we have that type of dish, but we have ingredients that maybe are specific to Georgia. For example, in Georgia, we're the number one producer in the nation of broiler chicken. So we have a lot of chicken. <laughs> so you, while you're here, you might want to get some fried chicken. We also are the number one producer of peanuts and pecans in the nation. So you'll see those items on our menu. We have Vidalia onions, which are an exclusive agricultural product of Georgia. So you can only get Vidalia onions in Georgia. They're, in fact, only grown in a 20-county region in South Georgia. So, I mean, that's kind of special and unique. It's almost like the champagne of Georgia because it only can come from a certain region. Oh, wow. I had no idea. So that's a very cool thing to try when you're here, when they're in season. And for those who have never had a Vidalia onion, describe the taste a little bit. Well, it's a sweet onion. So there are people that will bite into them and eat them like an apple. I am not among those people. (laughs) It's not that sweet, but when you cook them, they have a lot more sugar that comes out. So like if you wanted to caramelize onions, these would be really sweet. And in fact, um, I've had recently the the cheesecake that the chef had made, kind of a Vidalia onion sauce that he put on the top. That was really interesting. So you can do those kind of things with them, but you'll also find them used in savory dishes. It, It just depends how long the chef is caramelizing them. Sounds great. Now, other things I think of when I think of Atlanta, Coca-Cola and peaches. That's true. Well, Coca-Cola is made here and was founded and invented here, and we have the world headquarters. And there's a Coca-Cola museum, which is actually kind of fun. The best part is down at the, at the end, they have these tasting stations, and you can try Coke products from around the world. And it's amazing how varied the palates are around the world. <laughs> So that's kind of fun. So how is it different? I mean, you know, you're telling me that Coke in Japan or Coke in Africa is different than Coke in the U.S.? Well, the original Coke, Coca-Cola, is the same, but they have other Coke products. Okay. There's an Italian soda. It's very bitter. And then there's some Coca-Cola products in South America that are very fruity and sweet. And it's a lot sweeter than what maybe an orange soda would be. So it's, it's really interesting. Huh. And peaches? We do definitely have peaches. We're number fifth in the nation in terms of producing peaches, but we have a variety of different types of peaches, and of course, you'll see them on menus when they're in season. Tell me a little bit about some of the different dining districts. Where should I explore for great restaurants? There's great restaurants all over. The Atlanta area has 4,000 restaurants, 
So I think you'd be hard pressed to find a neighborhood where you couldn't find something to eat. <laughs> All right, where do I start then? <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess you've got a few options. If you're traveling here by airplane and you're going to stay in a hotel that's going to be, say, Midtown, Downtown, or Beckhead, you're going to be able to access tons of restaurants within probably walking distance of your hotel or perhaps even in your hotel. We also have a train system, so you can hop on and go to another neighborhood pretty easily. But if you had a rental car and you wanted to drive somewhere, then some neighborhoods you might consider would be Virginia Highlands, Inman Park, or Decatur. All three of those are a little bit more suburban. I mean, they're still within the Atlanta metro area, but they have cute little quirky restaurants. And if I wanted to go to a place and get something that we could say was sort of the quintessential Atlanta meal, you know, something that's very distinctly Atlanta, what would you recommend? Well, I think in that case, you're wanting to have contemporary Southern cuisine. And so um, I made a little list because I anticipated you would ask me that question. (laughs) And there's like a dozen. (laughs) Might be coming predictable. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) But um, so if you wanted... Contemporary Southern cuisine, you could get it all across the city, but some of the best restaurants would be Fourth and Swift, Five Seasons Brewing, The Chicken and the Egg, Southern Art. I mean, I could go on and Ooh. on. All right, so we got to spend a week there. And, and we'll post mm-hmm. links to all these up on the website so that people can uh, check them out for themselves. But these are the ones that, uh, that you recommend. And then what are the dishes that you would order? I, I mean, are we, you, know, you mentioned fried chicken. Are we going in and having grits? What, uh, you know, Atlanta barbecue, what, what do you recommend? You could get any kind of protein you wanted, roasted chicken, all kinds of fish. We have wild Georgia shrimp would be a good option. And then you'd want to get some southern side, like mac and cheese or cornbread and biscuit, black-eyed peas. And actually, peas here are really interesting because we have black-eyed peas, we have field peas, lady peas, pink-eyed peas, and, and different chefs like different ones, or they're available different times of year. Collard greens is a big thing down here. Okra. So a lot of times they'll have either fried okra or maybe stewed okra and tomatoes. These are the classic sides that you want to get when you're in the South. Right. And grits for sure. So talk to me about grits. You know, what's the secret to great grits? How do you tell a great grits dish from an okay grits dish? Oh, you'll know when you have it. (laughs) So if you don't think you like grits, you haven't had it yet because there are grits that uh, are more runny and cooked with water and they're kind of bland. Those are not good grits. Good grits are usually stone ground grits, and they're cooked for a long time with butter and milk and either stock or water. And then they're really creamy, and yet they have a nice and interesting texture. And then chefs like to mix up what they do with them at the end. So once they've cooked to the point where they're done, then they take it off the heat and stir in stuff. Like they might stir in cheese or jalapenos or green chilies or mushrooms or whatever, that's when they get really great. Mm, All right. So then I haven't had good grits yet, I think. Well, you'll have to come to Atlanta and I'll... I think I will. I think my exposure to grits was like, you know, the college cafeteria and I, I, you know. (laughs) Right. So... When when I moved here, I just had some that were like, why do people like these? And then once I had some that were really good, it was like, oh, now I get it. (laughs) Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. That's my problem. I haven't had the right grits yet then. Tell me a little bit about some of the big foodie events that happen throughout the year. There's a lot of festivals. Um, My favorite festival each year is Taste of the Nation. It's held at the Georgia Aquarium. It's a fundraiser for Share Our Strength. And it's usually in the winter. It's kind of a gala. But the chefs, they go all out at this event. They're serving really good samples of food. Because one of my personal complaints would be at a festival that sometimes the food taste you're getting doesn't represent the best of the restaurant. But to be fair to them, they're trying to serve, you know, 500 people in 20 minutes. <laughs> right. so, so it's not necessarily easy to do. But at Taste of the Nation, they really have good food. So even though it's a more expensive event, it's worth it. And plus, you're inside the aquarium, so you get to see the beluga whales. And it's, it's a very fun event. That's really cool. So was there a particular time of year that you think is best to go visit Atlanta? It's funny because as a food writer, having come here from Minnesota, sometimes in the winter when I interview chefs about what's on their menu, they might complain, well, it's not, there's not as much variety in the winter as in the summer, obviously, anywhere. But you can still get fresh produce here in Georgia, whereas in Minnesota, 
<laughs> yeah. They really would have a challenge. So I, I find that amusing because <laughs> you can still have a garden in the winter here in Georgia. But, you know, the flip side of that is that I imagine the summers are quite hot there in Atlanta. Well, it's not as hot as their reputation. You know, we're in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, so it's generally mild. I mean, there will be some days where it's hot. But honestly, the summers in Minnesota are hotter. Wow. All right. Good to know. So I can come in the summer. I feel safe now. I want to ask you about something, because something very interesting happened with the James Beard Awards uh, last year, which is that there was a tie for the best chef from the Southeast. Right. That's true. So tell me, for people who don't know, tell me a little bit about what the James Beard Awards are. Well, the James Beard Awards are like the Academy Awards for the food industry. So if you win a James Beard Award, it's it's like you won the Oscar. And so for Best Chef Southeast, we had a tie, which ties are very uncommon, but Chef Hugh Aitchison and Chef Linton Hopkins tied. They both won an award, and they'd both been nominated multiple times. So it, it was really fun for us that they both won. And they both have restaurants here in Atlanta. Empire State South is Hugh's restaurant, and then uh, Restaurant Eugene is Linton Hopkins' restaurant. And then he also has Holman and Finch, which is right next to Restaurant Eugene. It's a little more casual. Oh, that's very cool. Um, all right, are you ready to play a little game? Sure. <laughs> okay, this game is called Out of the Frying Pan. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you for some recommendations, and you just tell me the first thing that pops into your head, okay? Okay. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Here we go. Tell me the best place in Atlanta for an original cocktail. Well, Holman and Finch, which is Linton Hopkins' restaurant, it's in Buckhead, and it's known for its cocktails. What's the best name of any restaurant in Atlanta? Probably Southern Art is a really great name because it serves Southern food, and the chef's name is Art. Ah, so, <laughs> so it's not what <laughs> you think. And then it's right next to the bourbon bar, so it's hard not to like that. Uh, what's your favorite barbecue joint to go to in Atlanta? Well, I recently tried Burnt Fork Barbecue, and that was really good. So I'm going to go with that one. That's in Decatur. And they have a great barbecue menu, and it's a little eclectic in that they also have some Mexican, Latin-type menu items. And so that way, if you were going with somebody that wasn't in the mood for barbecue, they could get something else. And and tell me, what's the difference between Atlanta barbecue and other styles of barbecue? Georgia-style barbecue is defined by the way that the meat is smoked. It's always smoked with a combination of woods, one of which is hickory, and then what other local woods the chef likes. So often that'll be pecan or peach wood or apple wood, depending on where in the state it is, and then maybe some other woods. And then the sauce is always a tomato-based sauce that is a combination of sweet and spicy. I think it's a well-balanced sauce in that regard. It won't burn your mouth, but it's not just too sugary. So that makes the Georgia barbecue have a specific style overall. But I've interviewed several chefs, and they say that about every 50 miles, you'll notice a slight change in style if you really study it. So you could spend a lot of time driving around Georgia trying different barbecue. All right. What is your favorite place for a business lunch? I'll say Food 101. It's in Sandy Springs, and you get really great service, a nice atmosphere, and really good southern food. All right. What's your favorite butcher shop? Well, the DeKalb Farmer's Market is where I buy my meat, and it's because they have all humanely raised meats that don't have hormones and additives. All right. Last question. This is a stumper for, uh, you know, the person who runs Getaway for Grown Ups. When you've got kids... What's the best restaurant to take them to? I have an answer. Ted's Montana Grill. It's actually a chain, so you might be familiar with it, but it was um, founded by two Atlanta restaurant tours, including one of which also founded CNN, Ted Turner. And it's a very family-friendly restaurant with really good food. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Hope Philbrook, if people want to you know, follow you on social media or online or find out more about Getaways for Grown Ups, uh, how can they do that? Well, you can go to getawaysforgrownups.com and see the link to our Facebook page and our Twitter page. And then if you wanted to know more about the other blog, it's insathope.blogspot.com. All right. We'll post links to all of those online at mysterymeat.org. Hope, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Great advice about going to Atlanta. I really appreciate it. And this has been Mystery Meat's Fine Dining Podcast. My name's Seth Ressler. Uh, If you want a Mystery Meat dinner in your town, just go to mysterymeat.org. That's M-E-E-T dot org. Click the big orange button to get an invitation. Uh, If you like this podcast, do us a favor. 
uh, head over to iTunes and just leave a recommendation or subscribe. And if you are a food blogger and you've got a great restaurant recommendation for your city, you can go to mysterymeat.org and click the Contact Us link and let us know. Hope, thanks again. Thank you. We hope to talk to you again soon. Great, thank you. This has been Mystery Meat's Fine Dining Podcast. You can find links to the websites mentioned in this episode at mysterymeat.org slash podcast. Thank you.